Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us uh, an interview with Horder from Iceland on the Icelandic uh, Revolution. We're looking very much forward to hearing from, uh, from you, Horder. Thank you for joining us. I'm just going to go through um, brief introductions. So my name is Michelle Glass. Uh, we do have Mark Taylor Canfield, a reporter on the call, who's going to be uh, conducting the interview, and Nancy Korber from Project Recon executive director uh, and my boss at Project Economy, who will also be asking questions also on the call and helping us out with tech and um, promotion is Dean Edwards from Occupy Oregon Media. Thank you, Dean, for all your work on this call, and Mark Armstrong, who jumped in and is helping us with tech support. Good morning, or good afternoon, Mark. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for being here. And Horda, thank you so much for uh, sharing your time with us today. Welcome. My pleasure. Thank you. Hello. Hodor, this is Mark, and I have a question that I would like to start out with, if you don't mind. Yeah, we're interested in the economic conditions that were in place at the time that these changes started to happen in Iceland, because of course we can see that happening in other countries around the world. So I was wondering if you could give us a little background on what economic conditions you guys, you guys were facing in Iceland at that time. Can you explain a little bit about what was actually happening in Iceland and what inspired you to, to begin your protest? Well, we were more or less just in shock. We, we people were very confused. Uh, that was in October the um, the sixth, as, as I remember. The um, the, Paul, uh, the uh, prime minister came on the national theater, theater, uh, theater uh, national television, and he made a speech that really confused people. And in the end, he was very, very dramatic, very serious. And in the end, he said, God bless Iceland. And to most people, and I was uh, uh, with other people watching this, and, and I turned around to the other people and said, did you understand what he's saying? And people just shook their head and they said, no. What, what is going on? And this was on Monday. And uh, I was uh, I was very busy doing a job, and I um, but still I met people on the street and you know around, and I was asking what is really happening, and nobody knew. The banks closed down for one day, and people got scared; they were like losing their money, everything, and and but everybody was very confused, scared. That was the situation. You, you said that you've been involved with activism before. How did you respond? What did you decide to do? Well, I, dis I didn't decide to do anything. I, I had a job. I was uh, uh, actually I was finishing my biography, and, and I was working on pictures for that, for the for that book. So I was quite busy. But there was on on Friday, like. Uh, there was a small protest in front of the National Bank and I went down there and, and there were just about 100 people standing and shouting and, and, and screaming and, and I was trying to talk to them, what is it? And there were many people just standing aside and watching. I mean, what really was, uh, uh, didn't matter where I came, where I was and asking people, everybody was very confused. People just didn't know what was happening, but it had something to do with money, of course. We were clear, and that was very clear. But I, I recalled like things happening in Argentina and, and, and uh, in South America before, a few years before, and I was in Finland in 19 two or three in the, uh, in the uh, crisis there. So I was beginning to like understanding, but I wasn't sure either. So on Saturday morning at 12 o'clock, I went down and placed myself in front of the parliament building downtown. 
and I had through my home page and through uh, various channels on the internet, I had told people I would be standing there asking questions and I, I asked people to come there and I asked mainly I asked two questions. I asked people, can you tell me what has happened in this country and do you have any ideas of what, how can, what can we do about it? And I, I, I did this very deliberately, like placing myself at, at noon, because it's a lunch hour for the parliament members and most people. So I, st I started on a Saturday, I was there on Sunday, and I decided to stand there until I get some answers. And there were about, well, 100 people and a lot of foreign uh, people from the press from, from abroad. And uh, there was a lot of confusion. So like on, uh, I think it was like on Tuesday, I, I really made up my mind that next Saturday I would uh, start a bigger meeting, protest meeting. And since the, uh, the media wasn't really giving people answers, I called friends, uh, intellectuals and artists, and I called around and asked them, could you come and, and make a speech and try to clarify what is happening? So um, it was on, on, um, on that Saturday in October, the first big meeting was. Please tell us a little bit about your background before this incident as, as an activist and what you had been doing, just so that we have some um, background on you as a person and, and what your experiences were up to that point. Well, I have a long way to go. Like, uh, like in 65, I'm now 67 years old. Um, and I have a long story, but uh, I had to face uh, the fact when I was like 20 that I was gay and, and, and in this country I couldn't find any, any uh, answers to that. I was told to shut up and people had a terrible attitude. So that is really the, the base to uh, how I started like reacting and participating in society. Um, in 1970, I graduated from the National Theatre in Iceland as an, an, as an actor. Well, I, I became a nationally known person very soon for my talents in music and acting and so on. And, and, um, and I was really always debating the role of an artist in society and to my my opinion is that artists should participate and debate society, especially if, if like power is being misused by politicians or, or whoever. So in 1975, being, well, I don't know, I was, uh, I was in films, I was in theater, I was in uh, records, uh, I was everywhere. I was a very popular person. And I stood forward and I said, I am gay in a very, it's called an interview that is still called the interview of the century in Iceland. It really, it was like an atomic bomb. That meant I lost everything overnight. I had to flee the country. I was in exile in Denmark. Uh, people tried to kill me and, you know, I was excluded from every, everything. I was a person uh, non, da, uh, non grata for, uh, for a long, long time, for decades really. But I kept coming back. I kept like coming back with my guitar, doing concerts and well, play and talk to people. Of course, nobody came to my first concert. And I established the gay organization in Iceland in 1978 and 
Well, this is what I've been, I had been doing, more or less, debating human rights. And I was also helping refugees. Um, th this is what I've been using my life to. And, and, and uh, I think, like, through all these things, all these years, I, I gathered, like, um, experience. A lot of experience besides all, all the um, the know-how from the theater. I was going to ask you today in 2012. How does how do you yes. feel? Do you live in Iceland? Do you feel accepted? Are you do you feel like your life story has been vindicated? That that you feel more comfortable there now? But we have a saying: "There's no one. Uh, you can never be a prophet in your a prophet in in your own country." So no, I'm I'm rather silenced here. That uh, you know, it, I used to be much more popular like four years ago, but today uh, I'm very like silenced, and many people are wondering why. But. Um, I'm not bothered about it, really, because I'm, I'm quite busy traveling around Europe and, and even America, explaining my methods and, and how, I, I, how I work and how I think. But, um, like, I, I live a very peaceful life in Iceland, so to speak. How did it get to the point where you came up with the three basic, uh, well, I don't know what you called them, but in our country we maybe call them demands or claims. My way of, my way of working, I've always done this. When I, I get an idea, if there a situation that I don't like, I go around, I talk to people, I ask people. I don't have to know them. I just stop them on the street and I, I ask them questions. And... and uh, then, uh, like, what, after, right after the first big meeting, uh, the protest meeting, there were thousands of people who met up. We had good, excellent speeches. But I, it struck me, I was, uh, like, we were just asking questions. So I started walking around people, among people, asking them, all right, we are in trouble but what do we want? And it took me like almost three weeks to, to form these three claims or demands. And when those were ready, I, I, then I walked around again and I asked people, would you agree on these claims? Would you follow? Would you agree on them? And people said yes. So at the end of... October or the beginning of November 2008, these planes were ready and I took them to the meeting. There was a huge meet, a protest meeting and I asked the people at the meeting, do you agree on this? And then I read one by one these three claims and everybody shouted yes. So in a way, then I was very happy with that. We had found something to fight together because, for, because, you know, uh, dealing with thousands of people, that's obvious, not everybody agrees politically. So my job was to find something that would unite all these people. And that these were the three claims everybody could agree on. Can you tell us what those claims were? Yes. The first was the government should resign. The second one, the board of the financial supervisory authority should resign. And the third one, the board of the national bank should resign. These were the three claims, and, and uh, I really had very simple things, like uh, whenever I started, uh, 
I have learned through my life that repeating Andy. things. Uh, I, I learned uh, uh, the hard way in my, like, way back, like uh, 75, 80, that when nobody wanted to come to my concerts, I was living in Denmark and I came back to Iceland and I started traveling with my guitar and stories and songs. I, I hired places to do a concert, but nobody came except the janitor, the person who looked after the house. And since I was renting the house, he or she had to be there. So. Since nobody came, I played songs and, and, and told stories to the janitor just because I was there. But then I came back a year later and I found out the janitors, uh, they came back with her family and friends. So I began to understand that, you know, repeating things, you know, show up a year later. It's very important. And this is a technique I used in, in, the, in the big protest. And like on all meetings, I started like precisely at three o'clock and I told people this is peaceful, this is our society, and we don't, want violence, we want to reason, reason with the politicians, but we have those three claims and they better listen. And then in the end of every meeting, I asked people, do you want another meeting a week from now, here at the same time? And everybody shouted, yes. And I had permission from the authority to you can ask for permission, and I had that from, and I worked with the police and the city authorities. So I did this very legally. So how did those protests grow into a national movement that actually helped change the government and the banking system in Iceland? Well, the, uh, they were debated, like there were a lot of people who were against it and there were people trying to take over my role all the time. And there were uh, like the right wing, so uh, the right wing people who had been in power for almost 20 years, 17 years, constantly. They really didn't like me. And I was under attack as a person many, many, uh, many times uh, every week. But I kept standing there. I told people, for example, when, uh, when, uh, when um, Christmas came, there were very few people left in the protest meetings. So, you know, I'm, I am a director. I, I really try to read into people's mind. I, I talk to people and they were just busy taking care of their children and taking care of Christmas. So I sent out an announcement that I, I respect that. I understood that people wanted to share Christmas with their family and loved ones. So, but I would be there no matter what, every Saturday at three o'clock. So, People understood that I wasn't giving up. There were a lot of, in fact, many people were giving up because, uh, well, from the very beginning, I always heard the sentence, this cannot be done. You cannot do this. And I asked back, why? And people told me, this has never been done before. So I said, well, I've heard that many times in my life. But I think it's worth trying. So it was actually at, at Christmas time when there were like, I, I would think like 100 people met up that I was standing in front of the parliament building doing a little protest, not a loud one, 
Then a policeman came out to me and asked me to move away from the house. And I said, why? And he said, well, you are distracting and disturbing people inside. There's a meeting inside. So I said to him, well, can they hear me inside? And he said, yes. As a matter of fact, you're disturbing them. So I said to the policeman, thank you very much. You probably have given me the, uh, the best Christmas present ever. And I got the idea, this is a perfect thing to, to use. So when the parliament members will come back from Christmas holidays, I will ask thousands of people to come and with their pots and pans and dance and, and sing and protest. So they could hear us. They were always, the parliament were always pretending not to hear us. Nancy, did you have a question at this point that you'd like to chime in with? I would like to know how many and who, we pulled up some research, and it still is not really clear to me. I do have some names here. But how many and who um, really have been whilst out of their jobs? Are any of them now in prison? Are they just waiting trials? Kind of what's the status? Uh, you mean the bankers? Yes. The, well, the bankers or yes. policymakers, your leaders. Well, um, now I jump, I jump uh, forward. We we got the um, the government to resign, and and all the three claims to be met. But and we also made very clear to the the new government what we wanted. And one of them, one of the thing was that we wanted uh, investigation on what had happened in the banks. And there was somebody uh, who had heard of a woman called Eva Jolie. Uh, she's an uh, investigator um, in, um, in France. Uh, she had she was quite known as such. And we called her and we asked her, she, she was like a financial investigator. She, she was leading a financial investigating task force in, in, uh, in France. And we called her and we asked her to come to Iceland and we invited her and asked her to help us. And she had a meeting with the government and she agreed on helping us and she was hired and she said we should uh, establish a special prosecutor and the prosecutor uh, was established and uh, put into action and she told us like in 2009 that this is a very complicated thing to find out where the money w went and, and find proofs to, to take these bankers into court. So we are expecting to hear more of this this coming winter. But already, all the major banker, uh, bank managers have been taken into custody and questioned. Right now, three of them, three major bankers are in court. They haven't been sentenced. And one person has been sentenced for in two, uh, two years, jail in two, for two years. Yeah, I, Nancy here, I have another key question is to what is the status of the economy now in Iceland, what improvements are you seeing because of the choices being made, and what can you expect? I guess that's three questions. Well, this is uh, this is a bit out. This is outside my field because what I am good at is planning and organizing protests. I am not following details, but. Uh, in economy or political sense, it's, it's, this is not my job. And I have a lot of, lot of I'm surrounded by good advisors. Um, 
but as I understand, you could go to the national, uh, the national bank of Iceland, and you could like get information from there. It's nationalbank.is. So I cannot answer questions like that, but I, I'm, I can tell you as much as that we, we are like going out of the crisis, uh, as I understand, financially. That has taken almost, well, three years to work that out. Great, thank you, Hordur. I do, I do see two more um, hands up. So we're going to go for some brief comments from the participants, and then mm -hmm. Mark will get back back to you um, for your next question. So, Bob, okay. e, if your mic is on, go ahead. You have 90 Hi, seconds. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, I just had a question myself and many other people involved in the Occupy movement here in the United States. We've had questions about mm -hmm. what kind of a cri critical mass do we need. Like how many people did you actually have involved in making these tremendous changes in Iceland? C could you repeat it? I had a hard time hearing exactly what you said. Well, the question is, those of us like myself that have been involved in the Occupy movement here in the United States, we're, uh, we're wondering yes. what, ma what critical mass of people do you think you need to affect the type of change that happened in your country? Uh, how many people I would need? No, I, I, I didn't get yeah, that how question many, really. Well, how many how many people did you have involved in in your in your movement that caused the changes? About, ah, about how many okay, people? okay, yeah. I understand. Yes, I understand. Uh, what the way I work, and I have been doing these kind of things before. I always work alone. I have a saying, I use everyone, trust no one. So I, at, at every meeting, I asked people to help me. They could call me, and they did, and they approached me on the street or at the, after the meetings. I wrote down their numbers or, 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 or names and so on. And then I had, I think I had like 12, 12 people who I could, whom I could really rely on as sources, people I knew very well. One of them had, ha, had the job to check on every person who approached me. I wanted to know exactly who they were and if they were connected into political groups. And then I... I had like one person to take care of the financial things, a cashier, because I asked people to help financially. And then I had one person who helped me write letters because I wrote letters to, uh, to the politicians because I wanted meetings with them. And, uh, I had uh, meetings with all the ministers, and uh, and then I had like I think like ten people who are uh, very con well connected into Icelandic society. I think all to uh, uh, mostly I had like four people very close, but none of them took decisions. I am the one who takes decisions, what to do and how to do it. But of course, I, I take decisions after talking to people that I trusted. How much, do you have a sense for how much popular support you had uh, for the revolution among your populace? Was it 40% of the people? Was it 60% of the people? Uh, do you have a, well, an idea? That's hard or? to say. Yeah, that's hard to say. Except, um, well, you can never you you don't know. The only yeah. thing I could do was to keep these meetings going. Right. And, and how many? Do you know how many people came out 
to each meeting? Do you have an estimate for that? Well, there were like, well, you never know exactly, but 10,000 people. Okay. And sometimes okay. there were just a few hundreds. It, it, it's like the, the waves of the seas. Many, it, it depended on what was happening yeah. in that's society. Thank you. And it we also have... depended on if I got really good speakers. <laughs> Great. Uh, we do have one more quick question from Penny, and then we're going to get back to Mark and continue the interview. So Penny, you have 90 seconds, and your mic is on. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Penny from Grand Junction Occupy. Um, I was just wondering, from the start of your your process uh, to when you really got movement, like when the people in Parliament resigned, when your politicians resigned, how long of a period was that? I started the the first protest in in uh, the sixth of October, two thousand and eight, and the first first minister resigning was like, I think it was like the 20, 25th of January. The 25th, uh, 26th of January, the first minister resigned, I think. I have the date. And, but it took like uh, altogether five months to get all three claims or demands met. The, the board of the National Bank re, refused to resign. So it was in, until the end of February when they were really forced, oozed out of the bank. Great. Thanks, Arthur. We're going to get back to um, Mark Taylor Canfield, who is leading the interview from um, the northern part of Oregon. Thank you for your patience, mm -hmm. Mark. And thank you, everyone, for your participation. I do see your uh, question, Jason, and we'll um, jump back into the stack in just a few moments. So go ahead, Mark, with your next question, and then we'll get to you, Jason. Actually, I'm, a, I'm with Occupy Seattle, <laughs> but, um, but I work oh. with the folks in Oregon because they're great. But I, I wanted to say, you know, those are great questions, so I really appreciate folks jumping in on that because, as you can tell, um, there are real, there's real interest in the movement in Iceland from folks in the United States, especially activists who have been involved with the Occupy Wall Street movement. And mm -hmm. you know, people are, are really wondering, you know, where is our movement going from here? And I think people are actually, you know, honestly, I, I, I'm sure some of the folks that I've been working with are looking for good models, you know, that have taken place in the rest uh -huh. of the world. And so we're curious, you know, about how we can apply some of the uh, the successes and, you know, the, the interesting ways that you brought about change in Iceland to our own country. Of course, we have a country of 300 million people, so it's a little bit more difficult in terms yeah. of a national uh, movement. 